to the Cosmos SKA community call. Today, we uh, have a shorter call, um, but potentially we may even fill it up more. Um, just for those joining, the items on the agenda are some team updates. Um, we want to give an update on ADR 63, some of the core API work we've been doing. Uh, we want to talk about nonce checking in the SDK. This is coming up more and more. Um, Bez will help. Um, Bez will lead that conversation, and then a testing demo from Robert on some testing code that he's been working on. So to quickly start out on the updates, um, let me just pull this in. So updates. So ABCI uh, plus plus timeline. So right now, um, a good chunk of the team is part at work uh, updating the SDK to work with ABCI plus plus. We achieved a milestone today of making uh, things compile, and now we're working backwards on fixing some tests and making sure that everything is there and also documenting any breaking changes. We would love to have a uh, an alpha tag uh, we were aiming for this week. Um, we weren't able to achieve that, and so the goal is next week that we have an alpha tag that people can begin integrating and testing against. Um, that kind of leads us into what is going to be included in the Eden release. Um, so what will be included is a, we implemented an amino JSON encoder. Um, what does this mean? It basically means that right now we have this, these global amino registries in everyone's modules. And if you want to be able to decode uh, amino things, you have to, be able, you have to register them. Um, and so the goal with the amino JSON encoder is that it uses protobuf and protobuf reflect um, in order to be able to encode and de uh, to be able to encode uh, transactions and to be able uh, so we don't we can get rid of this amino global registry. Um, another thing that we've been hard at work on is the XTX module. Um, so previously, the off module was handling a bunch of this transaction signing and the off module was doing a lot of extra work. And so we spun that out into its own module, updated it, and it will be including sign mode textual. Um, and so this will also enable Hubble, the tool for uh, generalized interaction with all Cosmos streams, uh, to do transaction signing as well. Um, so we also, uh, thirdly, we're doing optionality for get signers and validate basic. So if we look at the SDK.message interface, um, right now there's three fields in there. There's proto.message, which is embedded. There's validate basic and get signers. Um, get signers has, is an optional field, same with validate basic. So what does that mean? They're being moved to extension interfaces in which uh, you don't have to define them anymore. Basically in your proto message, um, there's a proto annotation um, that if you look at SDK, you're able to see that it is, says who is who is the signer, and you say which field is the signer, and then that will notify the message server on who the signer of the transaction is, therefore re removing that extra boilerplate. Secondly, on validate basic, validate basic within the SDK modules has been moved to the message server, and uh, we did this to reduce the complexity in and boilerplate in code. So now. The validate basic and the validation happens when the message execution happens. Um, therefore, reducing the boilerplate of the messages.go and the messages to only be a proto.message. Um, of course, these are optional, so you do have the option to keep using validate basic and to keep using git signers. There are some users who will need to use continue using git signers, um, the likes of Airchain, Evmos for their EVM modules. We'll need to keep using get signers because how they do how they register who the signer is is different than what we do in Cosmos. Most. Secondly, uh, so uh, fourth, we uh, core API integration. This is um, the core API integration is basically core API is a Go module that defines a generalized API for modules to uh, use. And so previously, you would implement this like app module and app module basic. Um, in your module that goes in your modules. And now it's uh, dependent on this new Go module core API. And APIs don't depend on Comet or ABCI anymore. If you want to get some of this, this extra ABCI information, it will live within the context or within different services. Um, and so this will help, first of all, reduce dependence, the dependency graph on Comet. And then in the future, it has the potential um, what we're working on next is to reduce the dependency graph on the SDK itself. Of course, the biggest highlight of them all in the in the Eden release is basically the ABC++ integration. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, we're hard at work on this and we're aiming to 
get a alpha release um, of the Eden version next week, and they were able to begin uh, begin Q the QA process. We would love to have a release tagged um, close to the end of the quarter. Um, we're working hard with the Comet team in order to achieve that. Uh, and so if we're able, uh, so the, the goal is end of June, basically, and if we're able to achieve that, then you're going to have a new release to update. So for everyone who's updating to 047 right now um, or to the Twilight release, uh, get ready for another upgrade. And you have the option to also jump straight to the Eden release, which will have ABCR++ and a multitude of other features, like the potential of using a more performant IDL um, for historical queries and current queries. That migration will also happen in a lazy fashion, and so there won't be a large amount of downtime. Any questions on those updates, either about ABCI or about the next release? No questions. I'm taking no questions as you guys are super excited for ABCI plus plus and can, can barely talk. Um, so that's a good thing. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, awesome. The next thing. So we've been we've started thinking about uh, what is next after um, for the course. So we've been very focused on. Let me just pull up the ADR so I can share my screen. Bum, bum, bum. So for the past couple of months, we've been very focused on one part of the SDK to be able to move forward on modules and how they interact um, with each other, and also doing a bunch of research on in which direction we want to take modules and how users write modules and what languages they write modules and stuff like this. Um, but there's also the core level of the SDK. And so in the core level of the SDK, um, this where uh, Aaron just opened a PR to add a section to the AR63 about our core module API. And it really and it talks about a run runtime modules. And so, what are runtime modules? It's basically, as you can see here, uh, potentially uh, different implementations of Comet. So, Comet, the Comet V2, Rollkit, and other other consensus engines could be used with the SDK. Of course, Comet will be the default within the SDK, but it has the potential and optionality to be able to be used with other things as well. And so, this ADR was just opened. Um, thinking through some of the design. Um, so it's very high level. Um, but yeah, generally the goal is we want to the SDK to be able to support different versions of Comet. Um, they're beginning to version their protobufs and have, an, have a very uh, ambitious and nice roadmap ahead of themselves. And so we want to be able to support that in a more seamless manner. If we take, for example, the current ABCI++ integration, um, the ABCI++ integration is very heavy. Um, there's no doubt about that. The, the part that we're most excited about, vote extensions, is actually very easy to integrate because no module in the SDK uses vote extensions. But the API changes begin block, deliver transaction, and end block. And what does that mean? They actually combine them into a single thing. Uh, we've talked about this before called finalized block. And this changes how we run tests, how we interact with how we interact with Comet itself. And so this tight coupling of the SDK to Comet has made this migration a bit harder than it actually, um, made it a bit harder than it actually needs to be. And so we want to be able to decouple ourselves so we can upgrade to Comet in a more faster, efficient manner in the future. And so this is an updated ADR. Please feel free to come read, comment. And if you have any ideas, we're all ears on potential APIs. This is still very high level. Um, but we will be diving into this, uh, into base app and how to combine it with runtime in order for users to be able to use the SDK with other things as well. Um, does anyone have any questions on this? No questions? Awesome. As you saw, I mentioned Rollkit in there. So we've been talking with the Rollkit team. Rollkit is a product out of Celestia that is building um, a rollup sequencer for rollups. And uh, they're using Cosmos SDK 
um, as their basis and ABCI as their interaction layer uh, between the application and themselves. And so we've been working closely to um, alleviate any, any issues that they have, but also allow users to be able to build rollups with the Cosmos SDK and not only be stuck with blockchains. Sweet. Um, Bez, do you wanna do you wanna take away with the nonce checking um, discussion? Um, yeah, sure. So, um, with the so with the advent of ABCI plus um, plus in SDK 047, which exists today, and in 048, which will be really soon. Um, Applications have complete control over the application side mempool, in addition to having control over how block proposals are both made and verified. In the SDK, we provide a a default, a few a few mempool implementations, I think two primarily. Uh, one notably being the uh, a mempool that uh, sorts and allows you to iterate over transactions respecting um, priority and uh, sequence number order. So um, it's it's smart enough to give you transactions in the right priority order while also respecting the correct sequence uh, number. Um, so in theory, what this means is uh, with ABCI++, you should no longer be proposing blocks that have invalid transactions in them, or at least uh, not have transactions that like uh, have um, invalid, if everyone knows those transactions that say like invalid signature, nonce invalid, things like that. Um, you shouldn't see those in block proposals anymore. Um, however, there's still this kind of UX issue around, um, you know, certain applications have um, the need or desire to kind of like rapid fire uh, transactions to the node. Uh, many times these transactions are out of order. And what you'll see typically is the transactions being rejected because you'll get a signature verification error, uh, most, uh, most commonly due to the sequence number. Uh, so this is kind of a theme that we've been seeing pop up over and over again. Uh, the general feedback that we typically provide is, oh, we'll make sure that whatever is sending these transactions is sending them in the correct order, um, which isn't always a um, easy or desirable thing to do. Uh, to the point now that where there are some applications that have actually disabled signature verification altogether, um, at least at some parts in their stack. So um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to raise this point because it comes up over and over again. Um, some ideas that I had personally um, is to actually give node operators the ability to accept transactions directly into the mempool, uh, bypassing check TX altogether. Um, because again, the mempool is smart enough to know how to order these. Um, and then what, what, hap what would happen is when it comes time to actually construct a block proposal, the uh, the prop the proposer would only select valid transactions, and it would only select the valid transactions in the correct expected order. Anything that doesn't pass check TX uh, would essentially be removed. So it kind of like reverts the process. Um, instead of being check TX insert into mempool, it's directly insert into mempool, and then possibly remove afterwards. Um, so that's kind of like one idea I had floating around. I uh, mainly wanted to bring this up as awareness to see if other people or if uh, people had other ideas um, or if they thought about this more generally. Oh, that's mainly it. We'd also um, love to hear, uh, I mean, I guess the percentage is fairly high, but we'd love to hear from people running into the nonce mismatch check TX issue or deliver TX issue. Um, and I think it's like, a, we know it's uh, occurring on chains like Injective um, and some relayers are running into these issues as well. They're broadcasting very quickly. 
but would love to hear if anyone else is running into these issues as well. No one's seen this error? No. <laughs> I'm guessing, I'm guessing people have up there, um, maybe not tuned in, um, but, but yeah, so in, in short, I think it's uh, a large part is what Bez has been saying. We're trying to think through different solutions, um, how do you see it in root layers? Um, yeah, this, uh, I think this issue kind of got, it was kind of been an issue forever in Cosmos, uh, but it became really prevalent after IBC and root layers became a larger thing in the cosmos. And now with chains needing more performance or broadcasting uh, transactions in a more uh, more se sequential way or more like need more performance out of the chain out of a single account, they're seeing it more and more. Yeah. If anyone has if anyone has any thoughts on any potential designs um, to help alleviate it, there is like a confusion right now, I think, between application and Comet because there are two mempools um, right now and broadcast order um, is more influenced from Comet than the application. Um, and so uh, there is like a overhead there, I would say. Did anyone measure that overhead? Uh, oh, it's, it's less of a performance overhead. It's more like, um, so like in, to Comet, Comet doesn't know if like one transaction is supposed to come before another, but the application, like if you broadcast a set of transactions, let's say three transactions in order and the nonces are three, one, two, in the application, we will order it in our own mempool. So we, when we go to include it in a block, we will incl include the order one, two, three, instead of three, two, one. But because of how check TX works, we will tell the, we will tell Comet say that like hey these transactions are valid and then comments will put the transactions in order three um uh, three one two or three two one in the fifo list to be broadcast and it will be and it will be broadcast to other peers in the order three two one and so currently when it goes to propose a block it will propose a block with the order three two one instead of one two three um and so they will potentially like three two will be cancelled and one will execute but then it's like two and three are just need to be resubmitted or something like that. So it's like a, it's a weird. Why do you need to be um, submitted? I mean, like the whole, the whole mempool is there. I mean, if if they're like included in the block and then um, are ignored, then like on recheck, it has the recheck has the potential to say like, oh, this wasn't included in block, this failed, and so we're going to eject it from the mempool. That that's right, mm -hmm. right, guys? Yeah, I think so. So it's a it's a weird mesh between, um, yeah. We've seen sequence uh, so from uh, Ida. Um, uh, I always say your name incorrect, so I apologize. From Providence, we've seen sequence number issues very intermediately with rapid fire submissions. We'll be interested in seeing the experience of other chains running 47, 48 on main nets for a while before we update. Though definitely makes sense. Um, um, there's already, there's a couple of chains already updating to 047 um, and we're just talking with them if, if what their timelines are to either mainnet or to upgrade. And if those timelines uh, align with a potential Eden release or if they want to go with 047 uh, with the Twilight release before them. You mean that impacts 47 currently? Excuse me? I mean that, but does this doesn't impact the default mempool in forty seven, right? It, the I, I believe this logic has the potential to like, we we need a way to like, uh, in forty seven it's going to be alleviated. I don't, I can't say with certainty it's going to be one hundred percent gone. Awesome. Sweet. I think that's a good transition point. Or does anyone have any final questions on mempools, transaction pools, and all that fun stuff? 
Awesome. Robert, do you want to take it away with your demo? Sure. Um, let's see if this works. Do you see guys the editor? Yes. Perfect. You want to um, just slightly in, increase this font size. Sure. Yeah. Let me know. If... Thank you. All right. Um, yeah. So this is like the concept I was thinking for like I think already two years of splitting the keeper. I mean, we had like many discussions about the context, go context, and store management, and all the evil about it. For some time, I was talking about like the pattern of splitting up the keeper into the. I mean, so today we have usually a, a message server, querier, and a keeper, right? And the keeper is responsible about all the data processing, all the data manipulation and storage. So at some point, I was thinking more about like you know, splitting this keeper into the data access layer. So the data access layer won't have like the external dependencies and this ugly context, um, but never like managed to like make a sufficient proof of concept about that. And yeah, so for few testing, like in few test suits we had, there were like no unit tests um, in our project and that was cumbersome. Um, and like when I started to fix it, I mean, fix it, like change it, right? So instead of like this data access layer, I came up with this uh, keeper builder. So the difference is that uh, we have this builder pattern and what the builder what the builder is doing is yes it's, it's building keeper and trying to reduce the dependencies right so here we have the dependencies for the builder right um then there is this ugly context uh and then um and then there is this method which which creates this this keeper which uh, the i mean the keeper object which won't depend on the, on the context right it will it will have it uh, bundled in or, um, I mean, ideally it's not not inside. Here it's inside because of some other dependencies. I didn't have time yet to migrate. But the idea is that instead of, you know, uh, having it in a context, you put them into, into that keeper directly. So for example, like a block time can go here or a gas meter can go here, whatever you need. Yeah, so like in most of the cases, in fact, you don't need many of these dependencies. Yes, most of the time it will be like a block height, block time. Even codecs sometimes cannot might not be needed if you only deal with primitive types. Uh, yeah, again, so here, like, forget about that. Here is this context. It's here because we depend on external. I mean, like in this uh, this module, which I migrate, um, external keepers. Um, and like those external keepers, of course, require context. So uh, a, a way to sort it out, yes, how I think about it is basically to make an adapter, right? So whenever I create here uh, a keeper with this context, and for example, I have, okay, think about it as a bank module, right? So let's say I only want one function from the bank module, yes, sent from module uh, to an account. Then I will wrap it up. Uh, We'll hold that context here, right? And um, and then I have like a clear um, clear dependencies here, right? Which don't require that that context, um, right? So what are the benefits? Of course, uh, testing. So let me go through it. Oh, and and one more thing. Um, um, today we have like usually a one big keeper. Um, I mean, bank is quite special. I, I like bank module because bank is broken down into two, like a few ob, um, few abstractions, right? And um, in my opinion, like this is like undervalued. Um, I will show later another example of how how I use it as well. Okay, so this is like rather a small module. It's for controlling quotas um, over IBC quotas, uh, ICS twenty quotas. Um, and um, there are many functions. So how does it work? Uh, so let's start with this message server, right? So usually this is where 
everything begins. Um, so whenever we construct a massive server, right, we depend on the keeper builder, right, because we don't have the context at that time. And then when we enter the request, right, um, I created like the top to basically run some default validation. I mean, like if you look at the code, usually as yes, it's that you know you unpack the context. I mean, the SDK context. You do the validation. Maybe you do some extra validation. Or maybe let's go inside. Right. So here's okay. Validate basic and unpack the context. I have like sometimes there is this like a hmm. uh, some of the messages I created. I like promote this pattern of having a validate and validate basic function to validate is stateful, right? Um, if needed. So yeah, I, I do that all of it in, in this like a small helper function, right? Um, and then and then I do the all processing into that keeper. So I, from this keeper builder, right? I, I, I create a keeper function. I call the, the transformation function and and return. Uh, same thing here, like this, this example additionally emits uh, an event. Um, so when we go here, right, then like all of these functions here, they uh, they don't have they don't have like I mean at, at this point yes we don't have the context. Um, so it's it's easy to test. So with forty six and I believe with forty seven as well yes to create a context, we need to create the app. Uh, one could like argue that well you still need to create an app because you want to create a codec. Um, so often, like I said, you don't need to create a codec. And even if you want to create a codec, like in the like, good software engineering pattern, right? You, <laughs> for unit tests or a small integration test, you don't want to, like, you want to limit the dependencies, right? So even for a codec, if I depend only on bank and on, um, on my module, then I can register interfaces only from bank and my module, create a codec without engaging with the whole app. Um, uh, I have um, right. So um, another thing is, I know that you know there is this collection API. Uh, before it came up, yes, we were already like dealing with let's say generics. Oops, where is that? Um, okay, so let's go to like, here is this part has good examples. Um, Right. Um, so here are like all, all of this, you know, uh, access patterns. Um, so getting or loading the data or transforming the data. So like here you at the top, you have usually like getting and transforming. Sometimes for efficiency, we um, serialize the the coin by setting the denom in a key and the value, uh, sorry, and the amount in a value. So um, yeah, I need to like because this this pattern is repeated. Like create some util function for that. But other times, like um, for example here, right? We have this uh, generic function um, to code um, like a common oops, uh, common values. Um, I get it? Set deck. So here we have like a set deck, get deck, but then you have like a get value, set value. So this is using like a traditional Marshaller interface. So it can be a proto, bin Marshaller. So anything which goes through a Marshall binary and Marshall binary. And um, and yeah, some iterators. So like if you want to load all collection or iterate with the handler pattern, um, so this is another repository if anyone wants to like, check it up. Um, it takes the code. Um, again, it's, I think, like a simpler approach than the collection API. Uh, and often, I mean, both can be used, so depending on what code and how do you use, right? But as you see, like all of that data access patterns for simple things are just lines of code. Um, and here's like a to-do because like, the person who was implementing it for whatever reason, used a string rather than using a binary marshaller for the deck. Um, and yeah, and only later on I was migrating that code. So, um, okay, so now let's go to the test. Um, 
so as I mentioned, right, like the main advantage or like a main thing I wanted to tackle with is reducing the dependencies and make unit test like really unit. Um, so here I have like a two keepers. Um, I mean, um, to construct test construct constructed for a keeper, right? So I provide the dependencies. So here, this version will use a uh, Go mock. This version will use like um, in-house, let's say, mock. A very simple one, right? Like with predetermined um, uh, behavior, right? And and initialize the keeper. So what is a keeper? Keeper is basically a wrapper around like that. Normal keeper is a simply keeper, but also provides testing context. Um, again, here this context is uh, because of that um, uh, ugly dependency I told you about, like a bank or leverage. Uh, but like besides that, yes, then um, nothing else really requires it. So why I do like this test keeper? Why I construct the test keeper rather than like directly re returning this simple keeper? So the reason is, in fact, like I can create with this test keeper some wrapper functions. For example, to 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 do some common checks in SDK. Like I know many things were already updated, but I think it's still there. There is like tons of copy paste code. So in a test, like you can see, it's not that rare that you know that could be like a hundred line codes of test. Of a simple test, yes, single test, um, and then you have like a checks, and like this checks can like be like four lines repeated all over again, right? So if I wrap this T here, then I could basically have the util functions to do some common checks or some common operations, right? Right over the over over the keeper, right, and like avoid like checking all it, it all over again. Um, so that's a goal. Okay, so let's see how how this will. Um, right. Okay. So uh, another thing is that okay, here I'm using like a unit test, right? And the same package there are integration tests. So integration tests will uh, here follow a more traditional pattern, right? Like you know, you create this app, and then from the app you you you, you prepare the things. Um, uh, I'm thinking, in fact, like moving all this integration test to a sub package. So instead of having all of it in a keeper package, um, like create and and this integration test, right? Like uh, being in a keeper test to move it in the side directory, for example, keeper slash int or int test and and move it over there. Um, yeah, the reason why I'm thinking about it is I think it's just like more. I mean, it looks more beautiful, right? Because like the code is more compact and I have like a clear separation when I want to open the files. Um, instead of like separating them by name. But anyway, so quote, uh, so let's go to the quota test. Okay, so here's a simple quota test, right? So like, okay, it's uh, kind of like a unit test, but with three flows, right? Um, so here I instantiate this keeper again because the test keeper a test keeper which wraps the normal keeper so I can like call all these functions directly. And as you can see, like we really reduce amount of, of this you know require assertions. Right? Because we use this helper functions. Um, again, as you see, like no, there is no context here. Right? So um, creating it is blazing fast. Uh, I don't have any external dependency yet because um, in that package, so again, not the test with the test suffix, but the normal keeper, right? We only depend on interfaces. Um, so like running it is, is, is really smooth. Um, and another, like at the beginning, I mentioned, right, that we can split keeper. So. Um, let me show you this. Um, so when I started experimenting it, in fact, I started it by like adding um, functionality to our Oracle module. And instead of like extending the existing keeper with all that context and the dependencies, I created a new keeper. Like I said with the bug example, right? So um, a keeper which is like more 
encapsulated, right? And only cares about um, some subset of functionality. And instead of like creating some globals, uh, which um, yeah, often we can see them, uh, I mean, like a prefix, like all things. I, um, oh yeah, and another thing, maybe here to mention. Um, for that new module, right? Um, what um, what we are doing is is like also you no know, keys. So again, key there should be and like this data access layer, right? It should be like really encapsulated. No one outside of the module should know about like the keys. Like keys should not be ex exported at all. I mean, like the prefix keys for the store. In my opinion, so this is what I want to promote, and. Um, here, for example, in this module, um, right, we keep the, the prefix keys as a private um, variables in that package rather than in the types or the, the root package of the module. Um, right. So here's the example with this you know, subkeeper. Again, like there is no context. Right, so here's a constructor for that. So we have like the keeper of the you know, traditional pattern. Um, here is a constructor. So from that master keeper, I create. Um, so it's not like a keeper builder, right? Because this one implements all the other access patterns or access functions. Um, yeah, but anyway. So the whole functionality, right? How to in initiate the data, how to initiate the state, how to uh, do transformation required by that functionality is encapsulated in that object. Again, that object doesn't depend on the context. So as you here see, it's, it's only a store. And um, yeah, if I would need here something else, like for example, um, a date, the existing date, I provide it either by a function argument. So let's go to the, I think, should we update. Uh, Yes, here update the counter, right? So now, yeah, so when this is called um, the uh, block time, like the current block time will be provided. So let's just go here. Okay, here. So here how, here's how it's created, right? So again, here we have the, the message server. No, it's not like, it's, it's a uh, message server is one level above, right? But the example is similar, right? So we create that um, the keeper, right? Or the sub keeper um, by providing the context whenever it's available. And then we do the uh, transformation providing all the arguments required that, uh, to that. Uh, again, like, you know, uh, testing it, it's, it's very simple, right? Because um, I, I don't, well, I mean, the only thing I need here, right, is, is, is the store and um, and that's it, right? If I want to like deal with all the time, I don't need to create a context, like, move the move the context, update the context, I just deal with the time, um, right? So it's like, a time shift. Um, and yeah, so that's mainly it. Um, another change how it's going here, right, in the app.go, Right for that particular package, what I migrated is using the so instead of like a keeper. Yes, we have the uh, uh, keeper builder. Right, um, I'm not sure if I showed it. I think I showed it right. Like when you when you when you have that keeper builder, right, and whenever you 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 are in the message execution, yes, you, you create that keeper and then you go on. Right, so the tests are like massively simpler. You don't need to deal with the app, and you can like really um, follow the the good practice of you know the testing pyramid when seventy percent of your code is unit test rather than seventy percent of your code integration slash functional tests. Um, yeah, I think that's it. What I wanted to show. Oh yeah, maybe one more. Added a few comments here. Oh, no, it's not this one. So, um, so a few improvements how I would like to see it is that I think it's already happening in uh, 40, I mean, in the 
um, what's the name of this list? It's 48 release, I, I know, wait, 48, the next release, right? Because here the KV star, I mean, creating the KV star is not as many of us would like to see, right? Because, I mean, if I want to like have the simple keeper, again, like engaging with, I mean, registering the stars, going through all that process, it's really cumbersome, right? So um, the Cosmos SDK, Cosmos DB um, package already defines the simpler store, but uh, in 46 and 47, um, there are conflicts about how to use it. So yes, here basically like the evil part is the store, right? Like this cache wrapper and I think something else here is also bad. Uh, Basic star. I oh, know. I think only this this cache wrapper is because ideally I would like to instantiate it with the memdb, and and that's it. Instead, um, in the way how I do it, uh, okay, test right. Um, so the way how I create those. Um, um, um the store right so i need to like really go through um through the store yes create a store key um and then like, here is like a helper function uh to to create a again <laughs> so at this stage like this context is unavoidable but at least it's like really limited that you know a developer who's writing the test don't see it don't use it it's not bothered with it um, and the app is not engaged here, right? Because here, like you see, that you know, for codec or whatever, what's needed for the uh, for the store and for them, um, uh, for this builder, right? We, we do, like, really limit the dependencies. Awesome, awesome. Um, have you been keeping up with uh, a lot of the testing changes that we've been doing in the in the SDK as well? I would say kind of, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I was like probably 100% up to date with what was happening until February. I know, I mean, in the last month, there were a few new updates. This one I didn't check, but until February was up to date with what was happening. Okay, awesome, yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely, um, yeah, we're, we're revamping a lot of our testing as well. Um, if you want to share like a link to, um, you like testing code, we can also, um, I can pass it to the team um, and mm -hmm. have them take a look at it and, and sure. see if there's any inspiration and stuff. But yeah, we're revamping, we, we did our unit tests, we're redoing our integration tests, and next we're on the line right. to redo our end-to-end -end tests, and then we do the infamous simulator refactor after that. <laughs> That simulator is pain in the ass, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's too much boilerplate. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like the the thing I'm like really looking for is like the simpler key store, right? Because like module itself or a keeper itself should not depend on the key store. Yes, it should really depend, in fact, on the prefix store or whatever. Like the so yeah, key sorry. value, not this one, but the Cosmos DB version of the. I mean, this one, the DB. We um, so. As part of the core API, we, we introduced a um, mem store uh, service, a KV store service, mm -hmm. and a transient store service. And um, now modules themselves just depend on these services to get the KV, to get the key. They don't depend on the store key themselves. Um, right. And so, so it yeah, changes, so changes the design a bit. Yeah, exactly. Like, for example, here, this interface, this, I'm not sure if you see it in the browser. Um, yeah, but what we really need is something much, much simpler, right? I mean, it's not, in fact, the DPI. I, I don't know where is it now. It's yeah, so, I, so there's actually two, two things here. Um, so, so there's the core API, it changes the KV source service, um, and then there's also collections, which is um, this collections in ORM. Um, collections, mm -hmm. you're able to do a migration to use collections without doing a state migration. Um, in ORM, you would need a state migration. But um, so those are two options of like state abstractions that like reduce the amount of boilerplate you're writing um, for like KV store stuff. Um, that would be 
Good, good to look into. We've been migrating modules in SDK, and I believe all modules after one open PR gets merged um, will get um, will all use the KV yeah. store service, um, and then that will. So actually, here, yeah, if you go to core. Uh, if I remember correctly, like, you know, the, the ones, I mean, I, I like the yeah. collections in general, but the one thing I, I think I didn't like was that, you know, again, in some places it depends on the context, right? You see here, right? So like... But it's a, it's a, it's a Go context, it's not the SDK context. Oh, right, yes, it's a Go context. But isn't that, we so, need to unpack it somewhere just to get the store? Uh, not anymore for, for, for using oh, collections. Perfect. And so it's like, uh, actually, if you go, um, there's a couple of PRs, but if you go look at um, some some modules, we actually like almost removed Which one? for SDK.context. Um, almost, uh, so there's an open PR, I believe, for Gov right now that Fecundo is working on. Which one? Um, if you scroll down, they use KV stores, context return errors, and better iterators. Um, this one? Scroll uh, down a bit. Uh, I just want that, that one. Yeah, and so this is just like an example. Um, so what are we doing here? We're migrating to use the KV store service, um, which is uh, migrating away from using SDK dot context, um, and then we're returning errors instead of panicking everywhere, um, and then we're updating iterators. So if you go to uh, Keeper Keeper dot go. Uh. Uh, you see here that it's a uh, core types KB store service, and then um, instead of the concrete store key, so it removes the dependency on store from the modules. Um, I believe if you scroll down a little bit right. more, you should see a, an example. Um, so here, like previously, we were doing SDK context, KB context, KB store, and now it's context that context, and then you're getting store service, you're opening the KB mm -hmm. store. And then you're doing like store that set. So it's so it's removing the need for the SDK context here. Yeah, I, so I think like you know, probably like, you know, same problem tackled from two different sides, right? One is like I remember like, Aaron was like talking for a while about this you no know, store service. Um uh, yeah. and then and, and then like uh, the, the next level of this is like migrating to collection. So like consensus mm -hmm. bank and off. Are, haven't been migrated, um, and so there's right. no modules on the way, and then that will like even reduce this further. Yeah, so we started. I mean, I didn't want basically. I mean, the motivation here was that okay, we are at 46. That was like the average yeah. keeper at the end of the last year, right? Yeah. And you know, like those things are still not available even. I mean, so I didn't want to wait for 48 and. You know, uh, I think like you know those both, both things are right. Both things are not what I want to say is like both things are not excluding each other, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can have like the store service on the on the keeper, have like a keeper builder or have a subkeeper, and in that subkeeper either like instantiate the, the store service whenever you uh whenever you um uh, like you know create the helper keeper or um mm -hmm. uh yeah or use like and the other pattern. Yeah. Cool. Yes, that's it. Awesome. Then thanks. Thanks for doing the presentation. Does anyone else have any questions uh, for Robert? If not, then we can end and give back ten minutes to everyone. Um, especially if you're getting ready for the next your next call, take a quick breather, go for a walk. Um, inhale some coffee if you want um, and then see you guys in two weeks um, have a good weekend enjoy the sun ciao ciao guys bye bye, bye.